Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rita Brito, and I am here to host this session on uh, strategies, um, measures, and indicators for effective adaptation of cities. Um, uh, there are different adaptation measures and strategies to increase cities' resilience. To assess and decide what adaptation measures to use, decision makers need to know what's, what strategies exist, which ones are relevant for their system, and how effective they are. So this session will present innovative prioritization methods, new approaches for urban resilience, and will showcase some examples on the implementation of adaptation strategies in cities. Uh, as a first presenter, I will have Marc Voyer uh, uh, replacing Marie Boquentin. Marc is, um, is a PhD in Levy Safety Assessment and he has a master in risk management. He's a teacher in the field of risk and urban resilience and is a coordinator of the French national project in Sirtu, RGC4, and was also involved as a partner in H2020 Resine, Rescue, and we live. Um, I will now ask uh, Mark if you can please start your presentation. Thank you, Rita. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, is that uh, okay for the Yes, uh, we can see it. Perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone. My presentation will focus on a general approach to identifying and modeling interdependencies and cascading effects among urban services and their infrastructures. The presentation was prepared by Marie Bocantin. She had planned to present it uh, last March, but uh, she has since defended her, her PhD th thesis and found a job in another entity. Also, as uh, his main supervisor at the EIVP, I'm going to do the presentation today uh, as well as I can. Uh, so, we are talking here about urban services operating through technical networks vulnerable to hazards and interdependent, likely to generate cascading effect, very damaging for users and likely to greatly uh, worsen crisis management. Indeed, cascading effect uh, could make propagation of the failure of one system generated by an initial event like a hazard to other systems through dependency. To illustrate our point, we consider in figure on the left, on the left side, three systems, S1, S2, S3, where S2 is dependent on S1 to function and S3 is dependent on S2. If a disturbance affects S1 and causes it to malfunction, it can be propagated to S2 through the dependencies that link them. Indeed, the function link is no longer assured and leads, and leads to the dysfunction of S2. The sequence can then be repeated from S2 to S3. We can see it as an example, a chain of failure caused by Hurricane Sandy in United States in 2012. At first, flooding of electrical substations, then power outage over very large areas, which caused oil refineries shutdown, stopping of the supply of the gas station, which were not affected by the hazard directly. And then critical impacts following the dysfunction of the metro, but also the new needs for generator, which uh, need uh, hydrocarbon to, 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 to work well. We must therefore consider very complex phenomena at the junction between many disciplines, issues, sectors. There is fairly rich scientific literature, even if very few uh, um, approaches actually are implemented in the field of operation. Also, in the context of this project, uh, Rescue, we have attempted to describe the current state of the art concerning these methods. After studying uh, 52 references describing 32 initiatives, we have established that there is a great diversity of the approach. They generally contain all or part of the step indicated here, so to identification of how to 
to identify interdependency, how to formalize this interdependency, how to model a relation between component and related cascading failure, how to make simulation of failure scenarios, and then how to integrate it in a decision-making support tool. And so initiative we identified were uh, developing uh, all or most uh, often part of these steps. We observe a great diversity of methods depending on the nature of the leader of the approach, the field of specialization, specialization of the associated scientist, the study context, spatial extent, hazard considered, number of actors involved, and so on. So the input and output data of the model can thus be very um, uh, varied. So depending on context, objection, uh, actors, uh, and so on. In, we identify three main types of approaches. Uh, on the left, we saw rather top-down, based on analytical methods, often centered on one or a few networks. Uh, at the opposite, on the right, uh, we identify some bottom-up approach. We are starting from simple formalism, the simplest being a checklist or vulnerability maps of the services. Uh, then this bottom-up approach aims to collect basic information as uh, many services as possible with a view to developing a global vision of interdependency. Finally, we also identify the third um, ap approach, kind of approach, concerning uh, unifying uh, different uh, approaches from the uh, top-down side or from the bottom-up side, which can be uh, identified as uh, federated approaches. But uh, we identify a very few uh, uh, federated uh, initiatives for cascading effect. And it's a, a very difficult uh, uh, challenge. Building an ideal approach, the development of a single and universal, uni universal solution faithful to the complexity and dynamics of interdependent urban networks seems hardly achievable today. Numerous scientific, technical, and practical difficulties choice of granularity, data, availability, availability of data, stakeholders, involvement, and so on, makes the construction and implementation of a single model very uh, difficult and laborious. It seems therefore adv advisable to build dedicated approaches adapted to a particular context in accordance with local practices supported by stakeholders, but also composite and flexible. In uh, work package four within rescue, we develop a global method for assessing resilience using a cascading effect approach, which was based on work done by Fontanals, uh, Luis Fontanals uh, at the EQ, at the EQ, EQS and EIVP. Uh, so we develop a bottom-up approach, systemic and functional model, collaborating with stakeholder functional data. It is a method with, with a deliberately simple formalism uh, aimed at easy understanding by a maximum of actors. Among other things, it, it aims to initiate and stimulate collective assessment process of the resilience of cities, integrating the inter interdependency of service, networks, infrastructures, and users. It's Ambition is to make the study of interdependencies, interconnections between services, infrastructure, and users the basis of a resilient strategy. The approach deployed in Work Package 4 offers great flexibility and adaptation. It could just be deployed according to several spatial configurations within the framework of this project. In Bristol, it enables a detailed study of the vulnerability of service and their interdependency at the level of a district. In Barcelona and Lisbon, the study covered the whole city in more or less detail, depending on the networks considered. We see the step of the, the approach with the assessment, uh, purposes, uh, identification of uh, scope, goal, and uh, player actors 
preparation, assessment with identification of uh, interconnection and interdependencies, uh, and then simulation and decision support system to uh, minimize uh, cascading effect. Uh, so uh, uh, the work package for rescue outputs was strategic with initial training and holistic assessment, creation of the kickoff of the rest of work package to develop their analysis, method to identify essential service and project scope, tactical mobilization of different partners and players and identification of relevant information, open the path of the rest of work package for their analysis, dissemination with project particip participants. In operative, methodologically creation and study of matrix and domino effect creation of visualization of results. As we can see at the, um, uh, at the upper side of the, the slide, the training and assessment report at first, then creation of different type of matrix based on quantitative analysis, then visualization of interdependencies between services based on information from the matrix, and then visualization of cascading scenarios based on information from matrix. As conclusion, uh, the methodology used in work package four uh, was uh, in an interdisciplinary, multi-scale, multi-sectorial, multi-granularity and multi-hazard approach. It seeks to make various tool and method work together to bring together various subjects, stakeholders, networks, scales and objects uh, with a global collaborative and flexible uh, approach. And it allows stimulating a real dynamic and creating engaging a community of local stakeholders to tackle urban resilience. Uh, the methodology was pioneer created in Barcelona by Professor Luis Fontana from EQS Engineering and Business School and inspired, inspired by initial research at EIVP. Then it was developed and disseminated by a team of experts and researchers in other cities. In, a, in rescue, it was very useful for the kickoff of the project and helped all partners to understand what is resilience, a difficult task when you start a, a project with so many different stakeholders. We think it also inspired other approaches that are now being presented during this day. Presented during this day. Thank you. If you want to learn how to use the methodology in your city, you, you can contact us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I would like to let know uh, the audience that they can um, ask any question in the question and answers slot that you have there. Um, and uh, we will be happy to take those questions. But uh, as we are um, uh, the last session before the closing session, we will leave those uh, questions to the end. OK, so ask anything you want from Mark or, or any uh, of the other speakers. And then at the end, we will uh, grab your questions. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Uh, now we will move to Danilo Cansado. Danilo is an environmental engineer and he has a master in urban management and development and a specialization in climate change. His research interests include resilience, statistical learning, adaptation, infrastructure, and nature-based solutions. Currently, he is working at the Global Center on Adaptation and we, he will uh, speak about the key elements of urban resilience. Uh, that's a, a big task. So please move ahead, Danilo. Thank you very much, Hita, for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, or good night uh, to everyone, depending on where you are connecting from. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers of the URCC 2020 conference for the opportunity of presenting my research, uh, which, as Rita mentioned, is entitled The Key Elements of Urban Resilience. An analysis, of, an analysis of 13,000 cities worldwide. This research was part of my master thesis at the Institute for Housing and Urban Development Studies, IHS, and it was conducted in collaboration with uh, Dr. Alberto Gianoli, the head of sustainability and climate change specialization. We also wrote a paper out of this research and that is now being reviewed in a scientific journal. Much has already been discussed in the literature about urban resilience, its definitions and concepts that were incorporated over time. So I'm not going to explore this here. I would just like to emphasize that when talking about urban resilience at the urban level, 
it's important to acknowledge that exposure and vulnerability are characterized by variability within and across cities. And this reinforces the need for urban resilience to be approached in a cross-cutting way. However, a, the broad definition of resilience as the ability of a complex system to restore its function following an external disturbance cannot actually operationalize this complex concept. Many determinants and indicators of urban resilience are also often overlooked and provide only a qualitative measurement. In this context, the research had four main objectives. First, to review frameworks, dimensions, and indicators and build on existing literature to determine a comprehensive conceptual framework uh, to analyze urban resilience uh, worldwide. Second, to cross-check this conceptual framework with publicly available databases and identify which indicators can be measured. Third, to create a composite index with a robust technical procedure. And fourth, apply statistical learning techniques to, pro to provide a quantitative, quantitative measurement of the level of urban resilience and identify similarities across uh, cities. This research can be described as a preliminary analysis to quantify a comprehensive measurement of urban resilience worldwide through a common set of indicators that are already freely, that are freely available for consultation. Uh, it included the review of over 300 papers and gathered about a thousand indicators. Those indicators were then divided into the five dimensions of resilience considered, namely economic, environmental, institutional, physical, and social dimensions. Similar indicators were merged uh, into those five dimensions, preserving the, con the concept of each dimension. And this resulted in a, of, a final framework of 170 indicators. I will show you in the next slide. Comparing this framework with research from uh, many authors, for example, Sharif uh, from 2016, uh, who analyzed 36 community resilience assessments and also comparing with resilience characteristics, for example, planning, absorption, adaptation, and recovery, uh, it was possible to see that the proposed conceptual framework addressed existing gaps in indicators that measure urban resilience. Here, you can see the distribution of the 107 indicators across the dimensions of resilience that were considered in this research. It is a fairly balanced proportion across those five dimensions, which also gives uh, an indicative of validity of using this approach. However, cross-checking the conceptual framework with existing databases, it was shown that not all indicators actually have data available. From the databases identified in the research, the one chosen was the GHS Urban Center database from the European Commission which had data for over 13,000 cities and was the only that actually provided data across the five dimensions of resilience. Although it is recognized that not all databases were identified or could be merged, both by limitations of this research and also to technical reasons, here it can already be argued that existing available data does not allow to actually fully measure urban resilience. The difference between types of variables, ordinal or categorical, uh, and also initial analysis of correlation coefficients showed that from those indicators, it would only be possible to aggregate the ones that are highlighted in the table in bold, meaning the economic, environmental, and physical dimensions. The composite index developed in this research followed a very robust technical procedure that uh, encompassed four main steps. The imputation of missing data showed the need to work with two scenarios throughout the analysis. One, using a sample of cities that had all 17 indicators available for our smaller sample of cities, which was named partial data set. And the other applied imputation with the average value per continent to use the, full, the total initial sample named full data set. The norm normalization allowed to analyze the data within the same range of values from zero to one. The weighting and aggregation indicated that the principal component analysis method for the full data set was the most adequate approach to determine the weights of each indicator. 
Lastly, the uncertainty and sensitivity analysis tested the impact of including indicators that had low correlations and that could not be used in the aggregation process, showing their impact in the final scores and evaluating if it was uh, adequate to include them or not in the final index. After all this process, the level of urban resilience of those uh, over, uh, over 13,000 cities was actually calculated and plotted in this map using a geographic information system software. The dots in yellow to red indicate medium to very low levels of resilience, while the light and dark green dots indicate high or very high levels of resilience. As already mentioned, existing data was proven to not actually not allow to fully measure urban resilience and that there are more gaps for indicators in the social and institutional dimensions. The indicators evaluated cover the characteristics of resilience, but having more data could not only enhance the composite index, as well as actually improve the evaluation of the characteristics of urban resilience. The analysis of the performance of the top and bottom 10% cities compared to the global average across continent, continents uh, was possible to visualize that. In the top 10% uh, cities that you see uh, to your left, the GDP per capita actually had the most influence in the economic dimension, followed by green area per capita and low level of emissions. Furthermore, cities also had medium to low sizes, uh, to low sizes of, of area and also of built uh, environment. In the bottom 10% cities, it was observed a combination of low GDP per capita and green areas, high level of emissions or large urban, large urban sizes with up to medium built areas and full flood exposures. This variation across the top and bottom performers demonstrated that different urban areas have indeed a distinct level of levels of vulnerability and exposure. To conclude, this research intended to provide a quantitative assessment of urban resilience that could be compared worldwide to a comprehensive approach with indicators across five dimensions. Such analysis can serve as a baseline scenario to guide policies, plans, and strategies, which should, of course, uh, take into account the particularities of each local context. This research also calls for more disclosure of data so that it is actually possible to have a, a more depth assessment uh, based on, this on the proposed common set of indicators for urban resilience. The next steps are to incorporate new data in the current research as this data becomes available, and also to apply further statistical learning techniques, such as cluster analysis, classification trees, and other machine learning methods. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions uh, during the discussions. This is also my email in case uh, you would like to get in touch. And for reference, I left uh, a few a list of references uh, from the research and that I incorporated in these slides. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Danilo, for such an intensive piece of work. Um, we will leave the, the questions to the end of the session, OK? Uh, so now we will move to Patrick de Klerk. Patrick is an urban regional planner and ge geographer working as a senior advisor for the Flemish government in the Department for Environment, Spatial Planning and Development and Coastal Area. We can see from his background that he is in the coastal area. <laughs> his work focuses in the Flemish coast uh, with, and it deals with the diverse challenges in terms of climate, living conditions and working conditions, mobility, energy, water, recreation, biodiversity, agriculture, and cross-border coastal nature-based solutions to develop an holistic view on the multiple value added. So please, Patrick, move ahead. Thank you, Rita, for giving me the floor, Ms. Madam President. And uh, I would like to indeed present my presentation, Urban Leaders' Capacity Building on Nature-Based Solutions in the Enteric to Seas Region, Pilots as Triggers to Raising Awareness. I made this presentation together with uh, Bert van Severen, which is my colleague at Coastal Division. 
Now on the Flemish coast, the after effects of the St. Nicholas storm of December 2013 and the Chiara storm of uh, February 2020 were far reaching. Submergence of the shoreline in all coastal cities, greater salination of the coastal groundwater in the build-up areas, dunes and polders, and an increase in seawater reaching inland rivers at high tide. The main issues of this interact project SARC sustainable and resilient coastal cities are on the one hand raising awareness for the problem of sea level rise and climate change with urban decision makers because some of them do not feel there is a real safety danger and on the other hand using green measures that's to say nature-based solutions to cope with the problem. In the project area, the mean sea level rise could increase by one meter and a half to two meters and a half by the year 2100, which would see damage caused by coastal flooding increasing dramatically. Now, to cope with these challenges, a holistic and integrated approach is desirable. Integrated coastal zone management is a natural source management government approach with coastal areas that integrates terrestrial and marine components in time and space. So we need to cover social, economic, cultural, ecological and regulatory instruments in order to strengthen the overall impact and build capacity, benefits, awareness and ownership among different stakeholders. Now, for assessing the value of nature-based solutions in coastal zones, we're using the ecosystem-based management approach of the quintuple helix. Where the initial triple helix model is compatible with the knowledge economy, the quadruple helix combines media-based and culture-based public and civil society perspectives. The quintuple helix emphasizes, however, the socio-ecological perspective of society. For the Interact 2 Seas Project SARC, we are working together with coastal, coastal institutions from England, the Netherlands and France. In the following slides, I would like to zoom in on the Belgian pilots. In the first pilot, it is situated in Middelkerke. This is one of the 10 coastal cities on the Belgian coast and the Belgian coast is about 67 kilometers long. Now the city wants to strengthen coastal defenses against the thousand year storm surge and sea level rise. The objective of the pilot is to replace the existing grey measures by permanent nature-based investments. A part of the existing seawall will be transferred into a grass dike with new touristic opportunities, for instance, terraces to stroll, pleasant connections for pedestrians and creating new habitats. The slope of the beach will be extended and the zone closest to the current sea dike level is giving a sustainable, controllable vegetation with marram grass and other endemic species. The Austin pilot is situated between the city of Ostend and Middelkerke. Despite the absence of buildings along this stretch of coast, the area has an urban character due to the presence of the coastal road, the tram line, and the sea wall with cycling path and walkway. Now in the past, this strip of coastline was identified as one of the weak areas where safety standards regarding coastal flooding were not fulfilled. Therefore, the coastal division of the Flemish Agency for Maritime Services and Coast has nourished the beaches along this coast ribbon to upgrade the safety level to a thousand year storm surge event. However, excessive aeolian sand transport caused by heavy winds lead to numerous problems for the use of the adjacent infrastructure, such as the walk and pathways, the tramway and the coastal road. Clearing up the sand requires substantial effort, is costly and it takes time. That is why the city of Ostend and the coastal division are collaborating to create a natural landscape as represented on the right-hand side below. The dynamics of waves and wind will allow a dune landscape enough space to develop and create a specific ecosystem, providing new biodiversity opportunities. 
The pilot in the city of Blankenburg fits within the measures of the Flemish master plan for coastal safety to enlarge an existing small scale, scale dune bar inland and upgrade the environmental and recreational quality of the public space by breaking up a road and a dilapidated parking lot and finally providing a higher safety level. This way, a dune massive is created and additional delineated recreational shared use is made possible. For instance, dune walking paths, bike tracks, and better mobility. It stimulates the livability of enhanced walkability, green and open spaces, clean air, and environmental sustainability. Now, to conclude, we would like to emphasize we are convinced these emerging sustainable and resilient solutions can offer cost-effective protection while delivering co-benefits such as reduced greenhouse gas emissions, improved food and water security, and increased opportunities for livelihood and ensure that broad values are preserved, even enhanced. The usual constraints raised against climate proving and a mix of nature-based solutions is higher investment cost. While these may appear to be higher in the immediate time, time frame in terms of other alternatives available, we would like to underline nature-based solutions need to be seen from a medium-term to long-term perspective. Restoring degraded ecosystems and developing green infrastructure in coastal zones provide many societal benefits, such as a higher resilience to climate change and salutogenic added value. By elaborating different pilot projects, coastal decision makers are triggered to use more building with nature solutions and awareness is raised in a practical and accessible way. The current COVID-19 pandemic furthermore reinforces the need for a joint climate biodiversion ambition. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Patrick. There's a lot of work going on there. Then I have a couple of questions for you, but I'll leave them to the end. Uh, we will now move to Maria Guerrero. Maria is an environmental economist from uh, Carlos III University of Madrid and the University of Copenhagen. She, she specialized in the welfare evaluation of the water cycle related projects and assessment methods to value the impact of climate related extreme events to society and the economy. Please, Maria, you can proceed. Hello. Can you hear me well? Uh, the sound is a bit low. Okay, it's better. Yep. Okay, thank you, Rita. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Maria Guerrero from Setacqua, and today I'm going to talk about the methodology for prioritization of adaptation measures that was developed through the rescue project. I'm going to start the video too. Uh, I would like to begin by addressing how complex the policy design phase is, as it requires multidisciplinary assessment, political consensus, and taking broad assumptions. In the context of taking urban climate adaptation decisions, there is additional complexity compared to the policy areas. First, because there are uncertainties related to climate predictions, vulnerability, and risk impacts. Then there are socioeconomic, technological, and environmental future trends, which hold gaps for everyone. In any case, there is a growing movement from local authorities to act upon climate adaptation, to improve their resilience, and to protect their citizens. Therefore, in the context of the rescue project, we took the challenge to design and apply a prioritization method for climate adaptation measures and strategies. To do so, we started different approaches, trying to find the most flexible and reliable method that will fit the largest number of cities, taking the three research cities of the rescue project as first sample, which are Barcelona, Bristol, and Lisbon. Finally, we selected a method that allows different levels of detail, as we know that the provision is vital and is not always available in the same way. It was also important for us to involve stakeholders throughout the process, 
and use all possible resources available in the different cities. Therefore, we came out with this method that you can see summarized here and uh, that I'm going to guide you through using the example of Barcelona case study. So first thing first, we did the problem characterization to address the most relevant issues related to climate change. So we took, we met the, with the city council representatives, experts from every field, and took all available resources to define the most prominent risk and hazards affecting our city. Then we defined all available measures to address those problems identified in a platform developed for this purpose. The result was a broad list of existing measures to start exploring their potential impact in, in our city in Barcelona. So we also define strategies in order to classify measures by their target. We provided different strategies, classification possibilities to give, op to give options to the different needs of each city. For us, the classification of measures by strategies was defined by the different climate impacts and their assessment. As it helped us to assess the best actions to tackle each of the impacts without prioritizing one hazard over another. The next step was to do the preliminary assessment, where we had to select and estimate an effectiveness in factor. We chose the variation of the recovery time, which is related to the time it takes for an urban service to come back to normal functioning after a climate event. For example, we estimated how long it takes for, a, for Barcelona services to come back to normal functioning after floods caused by heavy rains. Doing this modeling with the business unusual and after one or, or various measures are applied, we can obtain the difference which is used as an effectiveness indicator. Then we did the preliminary or first ranking using the estimated cost and the DRT that I just mentioned as variables for each of the measures to calculate the cost effectiveness analysis, the CEA and a qualitative assessment of co-benefits, which was evaluated by a group of experts. This information allowed us to do a first rank of the measures per strategy. So we did this exercise for the four different climate hazards strategies for Barcelona. And we went to the next step, which is the selection of the top measures of each strategy. In this phase, as you can see, we shared the first ranking results with the stakeholders from the project and from the city council, and we reached a consensus for the down selection of measures. It was agreed to create different scenarios within each strategy in order to understand better the outcomes and impacts of combining different measures to face different climate impacts. As you can see, we analyzed the, the strategies for flood impact, CSO speeds, drought, and drinking water treatment plants closure with a different number of uh, scenarios, which are at the end uh, sets of measures, different combinations of measures to understand their, their impacts. We were lucky to have great experts within the rescue project who carried out the detailed modeling of the scenarios proposed. This is only a summary of all the assessment carried out for all the scenarios within the different strategies and their study. As you can see, we analyze uh, social sector uh, impacts uh, through the reduction of high risk for different, different variables like pedestrians and vehicles, uh, water availability, sea water quality, we also analyze uh, in detail the economic sectors through direct and indirect damages to business, to, to buildings and vehicles. And we did the, the assessment of the solid weight container stability, so it was very complete. I cannot go on further detail, but if you follow the conference, I'm sure you could hear some of my colleagues talking about them. And if you have interest in any of them, let me know and I will happily point you to the right person or paper published to, to have more info. The previous results were translated into monetary terms through a cost-benefit analysis, which helped to translate different variables into a unique measure value. 
this is the main benefit of this method of the CDA that allows us to sum up different variables under one unit of measure. Here you can see Maria, Maria, we lost your presentation and you are on mute. Something happens with the internet, maybe. Can you please? Oh, sorry. Okay, can you try to put your presentation and I'll tell you when sure. we stopped hearing you? Where did you stop? Okay, when you started to talk about this slide. Can you please? All right. Okay, no, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Rita. Okay, so you can see now, all good? Yes, yes, please move okay. on. So we, we did a cost-benefit analysis that helped us to translate different variables into a unique measure value, uh, which is the main benefit of the CBA that allows you to sum up different variables under one unit of measure. Here you can see, for example, how we add up uh, expected avoided damages, changes in ecosystem services provisions, and the annualized cost which resulted in the, in the results you can see in the graph. This is an example for the CSO strategy, the combined sewer overflow, where we compare the two scenarios models with the, to the baseline scenario and their different criteria. Finally, we ranked the results for each strategy using all the available outcomes. Therefore, we rank the scenarios under each strategy using four different criteria to support better informed decision-making process. This is an example of the flood strategy. Each letter corresponds to one scenario, so to one set of measures, which has a different color to just to facilitate the visualization. So it's interesting to see how the ranking changes depending on the criterion under which they are prioritized. For example, the scenario A, which contains measures X and Y, uh, is the best one for avoiding damages, but is the last one on you know, cost. Uh, then the net benefits uh, for the next benefits is, is the second on the rank, and for the risk reduction is the best one again. So depending on the stakeholder, they will prefer one set of measures or another, and that's why we we uh, point out the to the importance of stakeholders' engagement and multi-decision criteria to have all all to reach a consensus for the best set of measures to implement. So to finish up, I would like to show you the results of this process, which is a web platform where everyone can carry out this prioritization method and see the more than 120 adaptation and mitigation measures that are already in, also create new ones and introduce uh, new advances in, the, in the, this research field. We are fixing the last details, but Probably from next week, you will be able to access it and play with it and download charts and results and, and benefit from, from this tool. And with it, that's all from my side. Thank you very much from your attention, for your attention. Thank you so much, Maria. This was also very intense work. Lots of inputs from lots of people, right? We can see that in your yeah. work. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you so much. We will now, now move to Maria João Telhado. Maria João has a degree in geography and regional planning and a master degree in GIS. Also post-graduation in training for teaching geography at secondary schools. But now she is the head of the Environment and Energy Division in the Lisbon City Hall for the last uh, years. So, uh, Maria João, please move ahead. Are you listening? 
Yes, yes, Maria, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I will congratulate the organization, my colleague, uh, moderator Rita, other speakers, the authors of this presentation, also Rita, and uh, the audience. This presentation will highlight the key factors in the ongoing strategy of Lisbon Municipality for increasing the urban resilience and climate change assessed in the European project Rescue. To affirm Lisbon, uh, Lisbon's urban resilience as a continuous process, we consider as keywords the engagement of stakeholders to reinforce the urban resilient process to climate change in Lisbon City. To understand the global city, considering as a complex and dynamic uh, rescue project, considers a, a holistic uh, approach combining different sectors and focus in water cycle. This project uh, integrates uh, 18 partners uh, and consider the research sites of Barcelona, Bristol and uh, Lisbon. Uh, in terms of the principal goals of this project, uh, considering the three research sites, uh, we intend to replicate the case studies in terms of uh, resilience to climate change, uh, to increase the level of resilience of each city, uh, to, uh, in, to create or update the resilient action plans uh, considering local levels, uh, using a multi-sector and holistic approach. Uh, finally, uh, the most relevant challenge was to uh, join a commitment to act together now. Uh, what are, in terms of Lisbon municipality nowadays, the principal challenge? Uh, we have different commitments, considering different targets, different goals, and we need to combine all of them to create a unique policy. For, uh, to remind or highlight, we consider the Paris Agreement, signed by Lisbon Municipality, the Sustainable Development Goals, also signed, and nowadays working with C40 set cities network where we intend to finalize during this year the climate action plan. How did we do it? Uh, as a continuous process, we need to create uh, or set a road, uh, define different uh, ambitious goals, and targets to be commitments. And also we um, involve several resources, like you can see data, knowledge, strategic planning tools, frameworks, regulations, standards, training, uh, master plans, and others. Uh, this ongoing strategy combines in the same process a phase of diagnosis, monitoring, acts, and adjustment, or as we say, build back better, readapt. Why? To prepare the present and focus to prevent future scenarios. Uh, considering the future scenarios, we analyzed and assess several global emission uh, of greenhouse gases, uh, and uh, we work uh, considering RCP 4.5 and also the high emission of RCP 8.5 to, uh, uh, to decrease the temperature. Other important remark to include in our process were the historic events understood. It was important to know what happens because it's important to uh, remind 
the key uh, to remind the, uh, what happened to uh, increase the urban resilience. Here we have 57 uh, 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 meteorological events that occurred in the city with uh, uh, relevant cascading impacts for the function of the city. As a step up was given with this process, with the European Project Rescue in terms of resilience uh, building. How? In terms of the municipality uh, expects several um, commitments, projects, plans, regulation were re reviewed and aligned together. Historical events in terms of cause effects were analyzed. Climate change projections were stabilized in terms of uh, local level, downscaling. Lisbon master plans and the several risk maps were uh, updated or created using a GIS system. The evaluation of service failure with cascading effects uh, to other service or urban activities were other uh, remain mark in the process. How did we do it, this uh, uh, resilience building? we interconnect project uh, and create a mixed project team. This was a key factor in the success of resilience, uh, urban resilience for the city. At international level, we involve European, uh, project, uh, European um, partners. The European uh, UCLA partners or the, the cities that uh, speak Portuguese, the capital cities, at national or regional uh, level, we integrate several entities, uh, most of them for the metropolitan area. In terms of local level, we integrate different departments of the municipality, the parish, and also neighborhoods. We, at uh, other uh, relevant remark, we integrate urban utilities and other, other private organizations policy makers and also research. A big team using a sectorial uh, vision integrated in, uh, in a unique policy. As you can see, we integrate more than 18 sectorial dimensions in the process. In terms of the citizens, what are the principal results? return the city to the citizens and visitors. Today, we have a resilient city full of life to be explored. How to maintain the community involved? Uh, in this uh, rescue project, we create uh, several uh, films. Uh, we are going to present one of them related how to maintain the community involved, uh, where we can see uh, several actions, 10 steps of actions to a hi highlight the involvement of key actors who are responsible for the implementation of an innovative human resilience policy to the city. These uh, materials are presented in several, several channels, as you can see here, uh, for one year more or less.
Global goals can only be achieved if we keep acting together. And thank you. Thank you, Maria João. I think that is the key word of your presentation, act together, right? That's your global message. Yes. Yeah. Now, act together now. <laughs> now. <laughs> Okay, so this was a very interesting set of presentations. Uh, I thank all of you for keeping track on time. Uh, and we have time for um, to address uh, a few questions that were made by the audience. I will go through them. Um, so first, a question to Danilo. Uh, does the physical dimension of the, 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 your proposal address infrastructure of the strategic urban services? Um, and if yes, did you have available information for that assessment and to what detail? So the thing is, uh, you mentioned the physical dimension, right? Um, do you, do you um, address the physical assets in the city as a whole, or do you go to the urban services, to water, to energy, uh, or how deep do you go on the physical assets? Danilo, I think, can you see him freezing like I do? Oh, we lost Danilo. Oh, let's wait for him to get back. Um, okay, I will move to a question to another speaker. I have a question here to Mark regarding the interdependence methodology. Uh, and people are asking if it was done in any tool in specific uh, and generally how was it done? So I think that people want to understand, you showed some, some images, right? On the interdependencies and people want to know if uh, you used any tool in specific. Okay, th thank you, Rita. Uh, indeed, uh, there has been many tools that or many uh, approaches that has been developed uh, even within the rescue project, uh, according to work packages, uh, there was some uh, approaches that was maybe more sectorial. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the challenge was to um, um, was to use some uh, sectorial tool and, and to link result to link uh, data from uh, uh, output from sectorial tool uh, uh, aiming to 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 correct to to study uh, cascading effect and to uh, use uh, this data or to link this tool or to use this data uh, in a meta tool uh, some work has been has been done within work package free uh, uh, particularly uh, coupling uh, networks, uh, um, uh, networks, uh, uh, com compartment uh, like uh, ro road traffic and uh, electrical uh, mapping, and um, of course uh, sewer uh, sewer system uh, which could uh, aggravate uh, flood. Uh, and uh, there's networks working together to identify in a, uh, in a detailed mode uh, uh, cascading effect. Uh, so there is this kind of approach, approach which can be, uh, uh, we are analytical uh, approaches and uh, results have been combined with uh, other approaches uh, like uh, approach uh, developed in work package four I presented which mm -hmm. was more, uh, how do you say, uh, how is, uh, um, holistic? Holistic, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it, was, uh, 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 it was less detailed, but it was more uh, holistic. 
and uh, and the, the final objective was to gather uh, output from uh, both uh, approaches, analytical or more holistic, uh, mm -hmm. within a global framework that has been developed uh, in other work package, like uh, in uh, work package six uh, uh, and the framework uh, that uh, are presented in other presentation in this uh, conference. Yeah, okay. I have a question here that I think goes a little, a little bit in line with what you are saying, that you are presenting a piece of work of this project and it links to, of course, other pieces of work within the same project, within rescue. Um, I have someone asking, uh, when you talked about the domino effect and um, the way uh, when one service collapses, for instance, energy, then it may affect a pumping station and then you don't have sewer being pumped anymore. So when you talk about the domino effect, um, did you consider that um, if one of these species recovers, then all the others may recover as well? Or was it just a picture, uh, just to say, uh, what is happening if this fails? Or do you have um, an analysis of what happens over time? So do you consider the recovery time? And this links to what uh, Maria Guerrero presented, that she says that she considers the recovery time when choosing the strategies. So are these two um, pieces of work interlinked? Uh, it's for me. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> did you consider the recovery time in Thank your you. analysis? Uh, Thank you. Indeed, uh, the uh, domino, uh, the, 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 at first, it's uh, the interconnection uh, that can be disturbed uh, that is uh, studied, that is studied. But uh, in a less detailed way, uh, it can, uh, uh, it brought some information to study uh, recovery uh, pathway. Mm -hmm. But uh, indeed, at first, it, uh, it, it can, uh, provide uh, information for the uh, cascading effect okay. then in, in then in a in less detailed manner we can uh, bring them to uh, to have first uh, idea of a recovery process but uh, i think some uh, uh, approaches have been developed for recovery in a uh, in a strategic way uh, plugged with the approach of uh, work package four okay Thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, I think we have Danilo back. Let me see. Yes, hello. Okay, hi, Danilo. <laughs> hi, can can you hear me now? My you connection. Right when I asked you a question. <laughs> I, I was <laughs> curious to hear, but my connection dropped off at the exactly wrong moment. The so wrong time. Okay. For that. Let me just go back because I have this question up here. Okay, so the idea was when you mentioned the physical dimension of your proposal. Uh, do you address the infrastructures of the strategic urban services, like water supply, wastewater, energy? Or when you say physical dimension, do you mean spatial dimension in the city, the streets, whatever we see in front of our eyes? Do, uh, do you consider or not the strategic urban services? Yeah, well, th thank you very much for the question. And uh, in yes. Uh, I do consider both aspects. Uh, in fact, uh, what uh, the, the difference between the in the framework and the conception framework, the difference that in the physical uh, dimension, we are considering all the assets that are out there, but also a spatial characteristics, for example, density of uh, road networks, uh, location of uh, transport services, uh, but the provision of services, meaning the, let's say the, the availability of the services is actually also considered uh, in the institutional dimension. So that's just that division between the, the, the physical and the institutional dimensions of the work. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also what's based on, on the literature, some suggestions okay, of how okay. divide the indicators. So I have another uh, complementary question on that. Uh, and if, if, you, if you did so, if you uh, consider the, the physical um, uh, assets of the uh, urban services, did you have any, uh, what kind of available information did you have for that assessment? Because you assessed many cities, right? Yeah. A very large number. Uh, so what kind of information did you have? Did you have, uh, for instance, uh, information on the collapses of those, uh, of such infrastructure? Uh, how often do they go out of the service? What kind of information did you have? What kind of detail? No, exactly. Uh, 
actually that that level of information uh, it was not possible and the idea of the research was exactly to understand what uh, information can be obtained and can actually uh, that they have available data to measure urban resilience uh, mm -hmm. what we did include uh, was in terms of more general aspects uh, about urban sites built area uh, and also open spaces but level of flood exposure because this database from the european commission that uh, was used actually had that level of information so we didn't have uh, data on individual assets, but they did have more general information. Okay. Although I, I recognize that this is a very important uh, aspect to analyze as well. Yeah, well, you did large number of cities and then yeah. if someone wants to go deeper, they need more information. That's also your recommendation, right? Exactly. I think yeah. that's one of the main balances we had to find in the research was to, uh, to, to balance uh, the level of detail we wanted to obtain with mm -hmm. the, the size of the sample of, of cities sample. we wanted to analyze. Okay. Um, another question for you, Danilo. Uh, will your research become available online? Uh, and is your goal to publish this research as a free to use database? Yes, this database is actually free to use. So that mm -hmm. was one of the main objectives of the research. It is used this uh, database that was developed as I mentioned by the European Commission and it's uh, open to, to be used. So I, I can share uh, the link afterwards. Yes. And uh, yes, my paper is currently being reviewed. No, so it's in the mentioned. process of decision and I hope that it will be available soon. Okay. Um, so I think I will, maybe I have some other questions for you, but now I will move to Maria Carrero. Maria, uh, I have a question here. How are the uncertainties addressed in your analysis? So you have a lot on your melting pot. You address lots of issues. Do you have any um, any um, inclusion of uncertainties on the analysis that you make, Maria Carrero? Of course, uh, there are there are ranges of. Can you speak? Of... Can you please put your microphone closer to you? Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> there are ranges of values for all variables, and also we did. Um, uh, with the, the analysis and the different perspective to address the, the uncertainties, but also taking the, the experts' qualitative assessment and the stakeholders' um, decisions and opinions was also important to address those uncertainties because at least they are validated by experts on the city issues that help to, to cover those uncertainties, but of course uh, they are present and at, at the end we try to address them with the, with the experts' opinion on the fields and on the city, which know more or less better the, the issues and, the, and okay. how to address those uncertainties. Okay, and I have another question for you, which somehow links to this one. Um, how you are the economists on this uh, on this session and as far as i could see there were not many economists on this uh, conference so <laughs> this question is right to you um how do we place a cost on social damage and this has to do also with uncertainties right so how do you so when you have to balance uh, the cost of building something against uh, the cost of uh, facing social damage how do you uh, do this? How do you place a cost on social issues and how do you balance them? Well, on social issues, it was valued through the risk assessment. It, it, we didn't put a monetary unit on that. Okay. We could see in the, in the values, uh, my colleague Eduardo Martinez did, did the risk assessment and it's in terms of percentage of high risk reductions for, for pedestrians and for vehicles. We put a monetary value on the avoided expected damage. We okay, physical damage, right? So damage to, damage to, to okay. buildings, okay. mostly to private and public uh, uh, business buildings, taking uh, estimated values by, by official data sets. Okay, so I also have a question here. Will your platform be available for the public? And you also already mentioned so where can people find that platform whenever it becomes available? 
uh, thing from our LinkedIn uh, and Twitter accounts on Setaqua social media, you will be able to find the link. It's, let me, you need to put your microphone closer because we right. lose. Yes, it's adaptationstrategies.rescue.eu, but you will find it on social media from the Setaqua. From Setaqua and Rescue, and okay. Rescue, okay. You will find the link when okay, it's thank you. Uh, let me just check the list of questions here. So I think people were answering uh, uh, questions to everybody about Sustainability Magazine. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so I have a, a question here for Patrick. Um, you showed us a very large scale, uh, la very large scale projects. Uh, and uh, for a few, you, you showed pictures for others, you showed uh, what looked like design images. So some of them are implemented and some are not. Is this correct? No, no, all will be implemented, but in uh, due time. So we have a time frame what uh, projects we will implement first and what uh, will come later. But there's uh, sometimes there are difficulties with permissions in different countries. They have different ways of dealing with permissions. For instance, in France, we already have implemented in uh, that's in the city of Gravelines in uh, France. We already implemented the nature-based solutions. Uh, here in Belgium, some of them have been implemented, others not, but will be implemented. And in uh, South End on Sea, they still need to be implemented. So there, the permit still has to be put forward. So it depends from country to country what is the, the time frame of, of the project. But all projects that I sh I'm showing are going to be implemented. And certainly the ones I showed from Belgium, all of them are going to be implemented. Okay, because you said something in, uh, in the middle of your presentation, and we all are aware of that, is that this takes time. We need time to do this, right? Indeed. So we, we are fighting against time, but we still need time to mature the decisions, to have the support to implement them, and then to implement them, well, right? And question also goes to Maria João, Maria João Telhado. Uh, so when you when you have when you are you are involved in a process that takes so much time, it's important for everyone to have quick wins, right? To see something after the first year when you start doing it, there is all, all already something that you can show to others. Okay, we have improved this. We have this step up. We have stepped up in this aspect. So I would ask for you, with, uh, you are involved. Uh, in um, different stages of these projects, right? So the, the, the conception, the design, the implementation, what are your quick wins? And then I will ask the same to Maria João. In these four years, did you get results only after four years or you can say that to a city that is starting, no, you have this and that's when you start in the first year, in the second. So yes, we, we indeed had milestones put forward to do some uh, quick wins and other things on long term. Uh, but the first obstacle that we had to, uh, you know, really see is uh, the decision makers. We are involved with urban decision makers and we had two problems with them. First of all, some of the urban decision makers, that to say the mayors and the aldermen, did not see that there is a problem. They say, OK, the existing gray infrastructure is enough to cope with the storm for tomorrow in 10 years time or in 15 years time. They say, no. Added, uh, there, were, there were no added uh, measurements needed. So this was the first problem that we had to tackle to convince them that there is a problem. Secondly, if they indeed feel there is a problem, which is already good, then we have to convince them that they have to use uh, nature-based solutions, as to say, green measures, and that those nature-based solutions are at least as good as the gray infrastructure, but because still a lot of them think, no, we use gray infrastructure because we know of them, we know that it's good, you know, sea dikes and so on, uh, we know they are good, we, we don't believe in nature-based solutions. So this was the first thing we had to do, is convince them that this is necessary. And the best thing that we saw uh, of a way to convince them is really make them uh, realize the nature-based solution, show them what they are and what added values they have, not only from uh, a safety point of view, but from an ecological point of view, from a touristical point of view, from a cultural point of view. There are a lot of added values concerning nature-based solutions. And if we can convince them for instance, with pilots in other cities, then they say, okay, this is interesting for our city too, we will join your project. And this was really the first major step that we have to tackle, convince them two sides, first of all, that uh, they have a problem. And the second one is if they have a problem, use green measures. 
Okay, so the first kiss, quick win is to convince the politicals, right? <laughs> Absolutely. This was the first thing that we had to tackle. It was not easy. It depends from uh, one political political person to the others. But if they see it with their own eyes in a colleague, with another colleague, for instance, another mayor who is doing this, they say, ah, if you can do it, we will do it too. And they see the added value. And this is really very interesting. You can make beautiful designs and all of the, the key point of your presentation is the pilot is a showcase. It's a right? trigger to do. Yes, the indeed. Trigger. To do. Yeah. Indeed. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But Yuzhuan, what about you? What um, were the quick wins in during the rescue four years project and all of the others that you are involved, Lisbon municipalities? Yes, of course. Nowadays they ask for our contribution to uh, move on. So it's important our participation. In terms of uh, approval instruments, we update several of them. Uh, in terms of education, we create uh, several materials. In terms of in the field, we can see several actions ongoing, uh, finalized already. Uh, and we are invited to participate in several groups and uh, also uh, in um, several um, frameworks uh, to be to give contribution for the municipality as a case study. So, so you are you are you are collaborating with other cities also. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Uh, with uh, and with the European Commission, they ask for our opinion in several regulations uh, mm -hmm. and so on. Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. And also at national and lo uh, regional level. So not only nearby, national, no, but no. also at a larger scale. Uh, this year, Lisbon is the European capital, so uh, we are in the middle of the. So of you the see region. a lot of quick wins. Yes, as yes. the green capital. Yes, <laughs> especially in engagement, right? In uh, yes. citizen the engagement. The problem is uh, green capital with COVID. So yeah, it's a challenge. <laughs> uh, How to engage people that need to stay home? Yes, <laughs> and also to work. And also to work at the same time. Yes. Okay, I'm being asked from the organization for us to finish a little bit earlier. So the next, the, the closing session will be at 12.30 and we invite all of you to be there, but uh, we need to finish five, five minutes uh, before. So I would say we have a couple of minutes more. And I have another question here for Patrick. Um, uh, so you mentioned a lot of co-benefits of your solutions, of the solutions that you were presenting, uh, for instance, regarding biodiversity. Um, how do you evaluate those, uh, those co-benefits? Because when you, we are talking about the purpose, the primary, uh, primary purpose of your solutions, which is to contain erosion, right? You can quantify those, so it's easier. I, I'm not saying it's easier, but it's more um, quantifiable, right? So what about all of the other co-benefits? Like for instance, as I said, biodiversity, uh, how do you evaluate those? And in the, in the um, projects that are already implemented, uh, are you monitoring and assessing those co-benefits as well? As also as a showcase for others to see the multiple benefits of doing this? Yes, well, certainly, Rita, now with the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, more and more people are uh, going outside, looking to green and blue networks to, to uh, walk about. And that we see, too, in the coastal zones, more and more people are coming from the internet now to uh, stroll along the beaches and so on. So if we can make more nature-based solutions, if we can, you know, make them uh, in the different countries, of course, that are particip participating in this interact project, France, uh, Holland, uh, England uh, and Belgium, this can be uh, an added value, but it's an, indeed it's not easy to really calculate the tangibles like of this. <laughs> you, you have to make, well, some things you can uh, count the species, of course, you can the, the flora and the fauna, you can see if there's a, an increase of that, but a lot of the benefits are not uh, can be calculated in such a way. That's one of the main elements of our study too, is what is the value of nature-based solutions? It's like, like we were asking to Maria Guerrero, right? 
Indeed, indeed, we have the same problems or opportunities, if you like. We we want to see what is the economic value, but also the ec ecological value, the touristical value. We are a coastal city, so there's absolutely also a touristical value, cultural value, historical value. One of our partners is really into historical elements of the coastal zone. So there are a number of values, and it's very important to show the decision makers that there are many values. That, so there's a difference between gray and green infrastructure. Gray infrastructure, okay, we know of them. But when you use a green infrastructure, there are a lot of values that must be considered. If I can add, add up to that, uh, I forgot to mention before that we also monetize the ecosystem service provision changes for, for the nature-based solution measures that we included in the different scenarios. And uh, one good method to put a monetary value on them is the replacement cost. How much you would have to pay uh, or the, the city council or the government to, to replace that erosion service that the, that the nature provides for free if we leave it there. How much will it cost a whole engineering project to, do, to provide the same service? In, in the erosion case, that's a, always a good measure. Okay, thank you so much. I lost my internet connection somehow. So uh, as the convener, I just disappeared. But I'm sure you gave a very, very, very good and straightforward answer. Thank you for that, Patrick and Maria. Uh, I would like to thank all of you as uh, very interesting, all the, the interest, very interesting presentations that you made in the very lively discussion. Thank you for that. And I hope that uh, we can join each other at the closing session in five minutes. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.